I, I have done this class probably close to a dozen times. I've never done this one. So I know maybe Jerry, maybe a few other people have been here to a similar heart health workshop that we've done. It's definitely not this one. Uh, and so I put, we put a ton of hours into this. Really cool stuff. I think that everyone's gonna learn here something, but it's not about the information, it's about the action that comes with it, right? So all of this is great. You may think that 90% of it sucks. That's your opinion. Take the 10% that's good and then try to implement it immediately. Immediately, that's, that's the biggest thing with these things. So uh, without further ado, I wanna kinda pre-frame this cardiovascular workshop. So by the way, number one killer in this country is heart disease, heart disease right? So uh, does everyone, uh, raise your hand if you have a, uh, a first degree relative that has uh, had a cardiovascular event, either death or uh, close to death event, cardiovascular disease. That's over half of us. How about a second degree relative? Okay, so that's probably almost the other half of it. Okay, uh, so, and then anyone uh, know anyone that's on a blood pressure medication? Oh, okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, so, uh, so that's pretty much everybody, right? So it absolutely affects everyone. Uh, quick story, my, my story, the one who it affects me the most, uh, in fact, ooh, 13 years, uh, I'll be the same age as him. My uncle Jeff looked like me, right? Skinny, ex-Air Force, airplane mechanic, runner uh, and drop dead of a heart attack. Uh, and so it can happen. Uh, and so what we wanna do is learn some strategies that we can reduce that risk, right? It's not, it, nothing's 100% that's baloney. Uh, it's not, I'm not trying to sell you anything on this, but if you implement some of these things, and some of you guys have been here for years now, as you implement some of these strategies, your chances for success at life and at living are better, right? Versus, you know, we have the other end of the spectrum. If you follow that allopathic model, your chances for more medication, more sickness, more suffering, more disease. Once you get into that system, once you start taking blood pressure medication, when do you start coming off of it? Never. Right. So the goal is not to get it in the first place, right? So if you're in that end of the spectrum and maybe you're not on anything yet, keep it that way. And maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum and you're already taking something, right? or about to take something or your numbers aren't good or whatever it might be, then do something about it. Because people do come off that stuff regularly. In our office, I've seen it regularly. People come off. We, we read our, our progress reports all together as a team. One of the questions on that progress report is, which medication or medications have you started reducing or stopped taking altogether? That's an awesome stinking question, right? How many doctors ask you which medication have you stopped taking? None. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't really happen, right? So different, different paradigm, right? Different, different shift. So the problem is, is we have, before we can make changes physically or take action, we have to look at things a little differently, right? And so if you guys are like me, our whole lives we were taught uh, that, you know, sometime between the age of 40 and 50, uh, blood pressure might start to go up, start creeping up. Uh, if it does so much so, uh, that you notice it, then you're gonna, maybe on your annual physical, you, the doctor finds that it's higher than it should be, and then what do you get? A magic pill, right? Uh, so you take that magic pill for five years, 10 years, now you're 50, 55, maybe 60, uh, and uh, you go in and, oh shoot, those cholesterol numbers are up. What, what's the next thing? Another magic pill, right? But all the time you're taking the medication is it actually fixing the problem or is it just doing this? Nice, nice. Right, 100%, right? And I think we all innately know that and we can't poison ourselves back into health and you know we want this number to look a certain way, but that number, you know, we have to go with a major premise of is our body smart or is it dumb, right? Is our body trying to kill us or is it trying to save our lives and keep itself alive, right? And so in chiropractic, we call that innate intelligence. And so we have this, as a Christian, we just we have, we have this amazing healing power and intelligence inside of our body that every single one of you guys, no matter what your age or health condition, if I cut your arm in a couple of days, what's gonna happen? It's gonna heal, right? Uh, if I cut a blood vessel inside your body, I'm not saying I'm gonna do that, but let's say we did that. If we did that, in time, what's gonna happen with that blood vessel again? It's also gonna heal. So. What's happening is th these are processes that take decades of, your, of you stopping your body from healing, right? And that's, that's the only way I could put it. It's not a nice way, but it's all about responsibility. So what are we doing 
And how can we get out of the way and just allow our body to heal like it's supposed to, right? High blood pressure is not normal for people in their 50s and 60s. It is not normal for people at 53 years old, like my uncle that dropped out of a heart attack, right? But it's becoming more and more common, right? And so we look at last year, a year full of like stress and uncertainty and anxiety. Be honest, how many people's workout routine maybe wasn't as ideal last year as it had been in the past, right? And so they did a study on this. Uh, 65% took off time, and there's an actual study with this, off of time from their regular workout routine last year, right? What's one of the reasons why that happened for a lot of people? Mm -hmm. Gyms were closed, mm -hmm. right? right? And so we thought we gave ourselves the excuse that, hey, you know, they're gonna close their gyms, uh, they're gonna tell us that we need to be locked up in our houses, that, you know, just go home and die. Uh, Yeah, and, 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 right, and, and so everyone's so fearful, we, instead of expanding, we contracted. Uh, and the things that were really keeping us alive and healthy and healing, unfortunately, those are some of the first things that we cut from our life, right? Uh, and so think about it. Instead of, you know, I, I'll tell you, all last year when you're going to the grocery store, they might have been out of TP, right? They might have been out of, uh, you know, canned goods, and they might have been out of uh, frozen foods and things that you could store for a year. But guess what they were hardly ever out of? Your fresh fruits and vegetables. Almost never. In fact, I never had a problem. Uh, I never had a problem. In fact, if I was out of a problem at a small, small store, Wally World always had fresh produce. It was the last thing that people would pick at, right? And so uh, the, the problem is, is that we, we immediately went into like this like survival mode, which cut off a lot of the healthy habits that we were doing right from the get-go. So obviously, while we took some time off of our workout routines, guess what didn't take time off? Heart disease, right? So that process that begins, and they find atherosclerotic plaques in five-year-olds after an MVA, after they might die from an MVA, they do an autopsy, they're finding plaques in young children, right? And so this is not because you're born with it. This is not because you're genetically programmed to have plaquing in the arteries. By the way, that's not what kills you. I'll get into that in the, in, in the future here. but. It's, it's our lifestyle or death style that's kind of pushing us into this direction. And so, and unfortunately, you know, the food that we even, that we were eating out of a box and with all these preservatives and everything else, that's the stuff that literally is pushing us into this. So, not so much. Uh, statistically, if you look at the next decade, uh, we only see these numbers getting higher and higher, right? And so, uh, think about it, 10, year, 10 years ago, what was the heart disease number? 20 years ago. Right? We have more and more of a problem. We have more obesity, which is a risk factor. We have all these things that are growing and growing and growing. And so we're setting ourselves up. There's no way, there's no way that 10 years from now that we could be surviving and, and thriving even more than we are right now, right? It's, it's insane. So the cool thing is, is this guy. And so if you guys look behind Eric over here, I had this on the board. Uh, Number one killer in the world is, in this country for sure, heart disease. heart disease. Number two is cancer. Cancer. Has anyone here known of anyone that's ever had heart cancer? Heart cancer. Huh. Number one and number two causes of death. Why come? How come there's no such thing as? Lexi's listening because I asked her earlier. I don't know the answer. How come there's no such th thing or very, 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 very extremely rare cases of heart cancer? It's the only organ that's always working. That's part of that reason. Anyone, any other guesses? Also, uh, heart disease can cause from severe diabetes. It's definitely a, a cofactor, a risk factor for sure. So the reason why heart your heart almost never has cancer is because of that innate intelligence. And so this this is not woo woo, this is your body in self-preservation mode, right? Uh, and we were, we were discussing this earlier. So when you have chemicals and toxins inside of your body, does it deposit them in the heart? It does not. What does your body deposit toxins? Typically, furthest away, belly fat. Fat is one of the biggest things, so belly fat especially, but away. We were talking about, does anyone know what gout is? 
right? You get the uric acid crystals, uh, and typically, where do you feel gout at? In your toe, right? Big toe is the, the classic symptom. Uh, you can also get in your uric acid crystals in your ear, uh, ear lobe, and, and that type of thing. Well, again, is your body smart or stupid? Smart, right? And so it pushes that uric acid as far as it possibly can because uric acid is cardiotoxic, away from the heart, right? And so upstream, downstream, get it away from me, right? Because while, again, you can live without food for 30, 40 days, without water in the desert, maybe a couple days, uh, without air, uh, a couple minutes, that heart, we, we need that thing constantly, right? And so everything is cardioprotective. So your body would rather sacrifice another limb, a thumb, a toe, an ear, uh, a, a different part of your body. And, and if we're talking about toxins, it'll shove it to the fat, or if we're talking about cancer, lungs. People, we hear of lung cancer as one of the top killing cancers out there. But the, the reality is when you have lung cancer, is that like a, a thing that just developed like last week? No, you don't typically die of the cancer in the lung, you die because of the obstruction, right? And so it's because it got, it got so big or it's been there for so long and actually become a physical problem, not just the cancer itself, right? It, it, uh, your body's amazing, so it shoves this stuff off. The only time, the very super rare cases that you get heart cancer is when your body is super, so super toxic that it's just, your, your body's literally like going haywire, and that's when you start to develop these things, right? It's really crazy, and so you think of your, your heart is one of those things, along with that, that, that nervous system, that has to be functioning 100% of the time, every single day, all the time. Does that make sense? And because our body is smart, it's gonna do everything it can for self-preservation. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So, first of all, when, you talk, when it comes to, to the heart, Identify the causes. What's causing this? So what are some things that are, that are going to lead to heart disease? Too much fat. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about that. For sure, that's a great point. Diabetes. Diabetes can be a cofactor. It doesn't actually cause the, the heart disease. But indirectly, I guess you could say because of the excess sugars, but sure. Lack of exercise because the heart needs more Lack, muscle. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Nicotine. Nicotine. Again, kind of like a cofactor with that. Um, a lot of these things, what you guys are pointing at is inflammation, right? Uh, systemic inflammation is really at the root of most disease processes, right? Uh, and so uh, that's, that's kind of a, a big one. So I'm gonna shift over to Dr. B, but I'm kind of surprised that no one kind of jumped up and said the big C word. Cholesterol? Is it something like the heart or the arteries? Uh, well, cardiovascular disease. So it's. Uh, that, that would include both, right? And so massive heart attacks, oftentimes they're, um, they will, they, oftentimes they'll actually, they'll, they'll call them as blockages of the arteries of the heart, right? Which can kill that part of the heart, and then if you don't catch it soon enough, then you don't make it, right? Because if the car, heart doesn't have its blood supply, it dies, and if it dies, yeah, right. Go ahead, Dr. B. So what is cholesterol? Uh, who's heard that, uh, well, I've got high cholesterol, or maybe, maybe you don't have to say if you do, but we've heard of it, right? Um, or I, you know, I need to bring down my bad cholesterol. I have too much bad cholesterol. Or I need better cholesterol, the good cholesterol. Or hey, let's eat Cheerios, and that'll lower my cholesterol. It's probably can't have money in that. But uh, so, what is cholesterol? It's 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 kind of like. It's almost like earwax. It's like this fatty substance. It's kind of like, uh, like, a, like a soft, grease. waxy grease, right? So, um, why does your body produce cholesterol? Yeah. What? To protect the organs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, so, hmm. So, is there good cholesterol and bad cholesterol? I submit that we need both. There's the HDL. Okay, which we deem as good cholesterol. Then there's the LDL. So what, the, what do these even stand for? HDL, high density lipoproteins. Okay, low density lipoproteins. Well, if our body produces both, then we definitely need it, right? Do you have extra organs inside your body? It's like for decades, all the right? And so you, you, have to go, you have to go back to the beginning, yeah. right? So like this, do you have any extra organs, right? So you know, we see people losing gallbladders, losing appendix, you know, losing their female reproductive organs, 
and so on and so forth. You know, yeah. part of a liver or your spleen, whatever, right? If it's diseased, if it's sick, cut it out, whatever. That's a very mechanistic way of looking at it. If you look at it the other way, a vitalistic way, all of these things come together and they make you, you, and they make your body perform ideally at its, at its, at its prime. So why then would you body produce something that if cholesterol is so bad, why would your body produce something that kills you? If that's, if that's, that's the working theory, right? Are we, we're all on that same page. Am I the only one that's seen the drug ads that if your cholesterol is high, you gotta take this thing for the rest of your life, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, we're gonna debunk some of these myths as well and we can go uh, show you some of the stats, but. Uh, so the liver's in charge of making cholesterol, okay? Uh, so the LDL, the low density lipoproteins is pulling that out of the liver, putting it into the body. And then the HDL is keeping that regulated. Okay, we've got too much hair, let's pull it back, bring it back, bring it back in. Um, so a balance, we need a balance of both, okay? Um, so what does cholesterol even do? Well, it's in charge of wait, making, wait. What, oh, what, 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 what does cholesterol do? Yeah, let's open it up here. What are some things that it does? And you said why, is, why is cholesterol necessary for the body? Those this podcast said something about it, but I can't quite remember. <laughs> Anyone? Fire. It, 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 it protects your organs, but how about um, uh, your liver? Does it help the liver function properly? The, the liver, when functioning pro, uh, properly, will upregulate and downregulate cl uh, cholesterol. Yeah. Uh, missing the big ones. So cholesterol is vital, right? And so this is where we totally missed the boat on this deal. Cholesterol is essential for every single cell in your body. It's surrounded by uh, a, what's called a lipid bilayer, AKA fat layer. Uh, normally that'd be like jiggly wiggly, but cholesterol kind of stabilizes each cell. Super important as you're making new cells, you need it for every single cell. Your brain, your nervous system, your spinal cord, your nerves that are coming out, right? Cognition. This, this, this noodle here trying to function properly. Your brain is 60, 70% fat, cholesterol, right? So super important for nervous system function. But we're, we're not even hitting the big ones because what is the biggest symptom of people who take cholesterol lowering medications? What do they do, especially men? What's your question? So cholesterol produces or is, in, uh, is necessary for the production of testosterone. As cholesterol goes uh, down artificially, guess what's going down? Testosterone. Testosterone. So how's sex drive? Not. Yeah. Boop. Right? Ain't happening. Right? So the, the co-drug with cholesterol for most men is what? Testosterone. Viagra. Uh, Viagra. And so it's they sell you the problem, they sell you the solution. Right? And so it, you, it, it, this is hand in hand. Same thing with infertility. Guess, guess what? Uh, cholesterol is also the backbone for it. What's a chemical for Viagra? Estrogen. Uh, we're gonna go to, we're, I'll get a little bit more into Viagra in a second uh, when we talk about uh, nitrous oxide, uh, which is fun. Uh, but uh, estrogen. And then on top of that, vitamin D. None of this, no one knows heard of all this? Oh my goodness. Okay. So th th this is where, this is like this whole big scam. Be because Cholesterol is so necessary for the body, it decreases inflammation of the body, right? Cholesterol, you don't die from cholesterol. You die from the, possibly, possibly part of the cause of death is the oxidation of cholesterol, not the cholesterol itself, right? So it, it, it's producing a response to an increased inflammation. It's absolutely required in, in estrogen and testosterone production. It's a backbone of that. And also vitamin D. So if you're artificially lowering that, right? Guess what's all gonna suffer? everything downstream but don't worry we have a chemical solution for those too right and you kind of see where this is going that's where one leads to the next leads to the next leads to the next right and not to mention cholesterol again we we, we need it as part of our our system what if you have low low cholesterol so funny thing about without, low cholesterol without, what's, a, what's a funny stat that you might have not have heard of i wrote this down somewhere oh it's in my pocket so uh with low cholesterol, there are more deaths. The death rate is higher with low cholesterol as compared to high cholesterol. So do Did we you need know cholesterol that? in our system? Yes. yes. Yes, we do. Okay, we lower it too much. 
equals death. Bad, bad things happen. Okay. Right. But if you don't produce, that's what my problem. Not to make it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I don't so, produce cholesterol. So, so it's okay. Let, let's let's go back to where does production? So, uh, I'm thinking like a, a naturalist, like a chiropractor. So, uh, cholesterol is produced by the liver. It's in, it's in response to two things. So you have eighty percent of cholesterol is based on is is produced from the liver, twenty percent from the diet. So you can eat if you have higher cholesterol, you could obviously consume the things that are not uh, uh, continue putting up there, right? But I would submit to you that if you have higher cholesterol, the question for yourself would be why? Why is your body producing the cholesterol? Rather than artificially lowering down a number, why is it producing the higher cholesterol? And so uh, a lot of people like, I, there's one of the guys that, that uh, one of our mentors that I've known for 12 years now, uh, he was going through a, a uh, autoimmune disease. His cholesterol numbers, anyone know what normal should be? Uh, 160. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so certainly sub 200, right? Uh, and so uh, his were uh, in the 400 range, right? So let's just say if he, if he was in the hospital, they wouldn't even let him leave uh, until they artificially lowered that number. Number. Thank goodness he didn't go to the hospital because his body was fighting the inflammation uh, from this condition that he was dealing with, and it was the right response at the right time that, that allowed him, and he was in his 40s, that allowed him to kind of overcome this, this autoimmune condition. And now it's, as, as he's overcame that uh, autoimmune uh, condition, his, his cholesterol number is back to normal, right? And if you saw him, you'd be like, well, that's weird that, you know, you look skinny, I know you're eating healthy, what, what's going on with that? It ended up being Lyme's disease, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, it, once his body was, had that under control, that infection under control, uh, his cholesterol went down, back, back down to, uh, to normal. So, oh, sorry. Uh, no, no. So, the good HDL, the good cholesterol, uh, is is pulling, is, is cleaning the arteries. Okay, it's it's making sure that things are nice and smooth. The the bad H, the LDL, the cholesterol. When we have too much of that, that's where it can seep into the bloodstream, get oxidized. And the oxidation of cholesterol, that's where it can turn south on us, okay? So it, just like anything, we need moderation, we need a balance, right? Um, same thing with cholesterol in our, in our system. Um, it's, we need them both, and they both serve a purpose. Uh, like we were talking about, the, yeah, every cell in the body has a, has a wall, basically a lipid wall, formed by cholesterol. So this guy, is more of a the firmer you know if we're talking bad it's like okay if it's in the bloodstream too much it's sclerosing in there it's building up plaque right um this guy is coming in and cleaning it up so the balance hence we have the balance um so let's just get back over this so we've all heard of this plaquing of the arteries right and, and it's like this like this death this death thing right so again major premise why why would our smart intelligent body want to lay down plaque in our arteries. <laughs> it's right to fix something, right? And so it's your your body increases to uh, uh, cholesterol production in response to inflammation. And so when you have higher inflammation of those arteries, typically caused by sugar, not excess fat, uh, that's and, and toxins actually, sugar and toxins, that's when your body is gonna use this cholesterol as a spackle on the arteries. And that's a good thing, because if those arteries are inflamed, then it is gonna disrupt the, the flow of blood, and then you're gonna have more problems as well. And so it calms it down, right? And then it's the, if you keep living that, that death style, and keep consuming the sugar, that's the oxidation of that cholesterol that can keep forming that, that plaque. Instead of the balance of that HDL coming again, it should be the, all, uh, the rest of your healthy diet picking up those free radicals, right? Instead of them having to be caught up by the cholesterol, which is like a, kind of like a weak um, uh, free radical receptor. That, uh, that's really the biochemistry behind it. So he kind of he kind of mentioned this one already, but uh, the same thing is like we we worked so hard to get these cholesterol numbers low that when you actually analyze the data of the people that are dying of heart disease and heart heart attacks. The people that are dying are actually the ones that have the artificially low numbers, right? And so, because we're not we're not treating the disease at the cause, we're just oh that's a bad number. Let's get that one down. Okay, that's a bad number. Let's artificially get that one down. 
But why is it a bad number in the first place? Bad number, right? And so we need to, we need to start thinking about that instead of having, and have, start having more conversations and encouraging people to start taking action, kind of like what we do here versus just here, take this and then come back when it's bad again, right? And it's, it's not empowering people to take action and responsibility for their own, own health. So I just wanted to interject there, cholesterol repairs. Uh, like we just, we mentioned. So I think cholesterol repairs, okay? It is a good, it is a good thing. And some of those, uh, on the last slide, were, were cut off, but more, there's more heart attacks with, in, in patient, people with normal cholesterol levels than there are in, in higher cholesterol levels. So these are all, and, and again, here's one, here's, here's one of the studies, uh, in the bottom, I can I can send someone if they need some more research uh, to look at it. I doubt if, if if I know people after COVID, no one actually reads the research because if you did, right? Uh, we I, I can give you lots and lots of research versus mass versus the number of people dying, right? All of these things, death number was virtually the same, 2019 versus 2020, right? So if you actually read the numbers, then we would all be doing life a little bit differently right now. But we we get blasted right by media by propaganda that tell us to do a certain thing right and so oftentimes with something trying to sell us there in the process i i am not here to sell you anything uh for your heart disease <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm here to tell you tell you to do something that's challenging difficult takes discipline uh takes energy and focus may even take more money than going to the dollar menu but certainly is going to save you money in the long haul right so that's not an easy sell and that's why it's not done Right, but it's also the very same thing that can save your life and the loved ones. And we know that 800 something thousand people that are dying every single year from cardiovascular disease. Right. So when you actually look into the numbers, the numbers support take like listening to your body and taking the appropriate measures to, to do things the right way. I think we hit that pretty hard. Uh, our Stanton's answer. Uh, there's just a it's the number one uh, profitable uh, profiting medication uh, uh, out there uh, since it was patented and now it's off patent but still uh, number one number one income medication uh, was the statins and, and maybe a little bit less you hear of it now why because it's not on patent anymore right especially with the big ones so what can we do instead if I said it's the oxidation of cholesterol that's the problem we need to work on our free radicals, we need to work on our inflammation. So uh, things like turmeric. Who's heard of red yeast rice before, right? These are things that you can get very simply, very inexpensively, uh, natural, uh, uh, like natural grocers or something like that uh, would have these, I, I, as long as I've seen it. Uh, if you are on a set and you're unwilling to talk to your doctor about reducing your uh, need for that, right? then it is an absolute must, you must be on CoQ10. Oh, uh, what uh, level of your recommend? Just check with the doctor? Or yeah, I mean, usually, <laughs> my rule of thumb is, if, if there's a capsule out there, probably you're gonna need double or triple that. Because uh, it's usually less, like, so for people like vitamin D, oftentimes the capsules are like 1,000 or 2,000, uh, or uh, uh, I use international units. And so I personally take like 10,000, uh, close to 10,000 a day. Uh, CoQ10? Uh, no, of, of uh, vitamin D. Yeah. Of CoQ10, I'd have, to, I'd have to look that up specifically. Yeah. So let's hit this real quick. Um, we talked about how every cell is, in, uh, is composed of fat, right? We talked about our central nervous system, primarily composed of fat, right? And so we've had this low fat diet since what like the 80s, 90s? Maybe 90s, maybe? Sure. Yeah, does that sound about right? Uh, we kind of switched into margarine, kind of switched into like skim milk, you know, low fat yogurt, low fat this, low fat that, right? right. Something like that. How's that been working for our waistlines? Right, so like if we just step back and just like if we're looking at the American population in the last 20 years, 30 years, how's that? How, how are we doing? Yeah, not good. Yeah, not good. Yeah, not good. Right, and so it's it's not it's not the fat, it's the bad fat because we cut out butter, we cut out 
our steak or theoretically our, our fatty steak or our fatty meat, right? Uh, and maybe even our fatty fish. And what do we switch it to? Corn oil, vegetable oil, canola oil, which there's no such thing, right? Because this thing is a canola plant. What's canola oil? Carb oil. Oh, come on, that's my favorite one. Emily always makes fun of me. It's a rapeseed. It's not a rapeseed? Rape. 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 Yeah, not very marketable. <laughs> so they changed it to canola oil, Canada oil low acid. Yeah, look it up. Uh, and so uh, let's see, you, you, anyone you guys, I'm, I'm from Michigan. We grew a lot of corn up there as well, right? Uh, think of a corn stalk. How much oil and how much work would you have to do to get oil out of a couple heads of corn? A lot, a lot of processing, a lot of unnatural processes required to get a little bit of oil out of that corn stalk, right? And so it's that denatured, rancid, toxic oil, right? That's really been uh, 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 one of the main problems that we see in our society, right? Instead of where things like coconut oil, I mean, they went after coconut oil hard, right? Uh, a couple years ago, like everyone started switching to coconut oil and then like big food said, no, we don't like coconut oil. You should be doing, right? It was like, oh, coconut oil is bad for this. Coconut oil is bad for this. Baloney, right? It's, the, it's one of the very few heat stable uh, oils that you can cook with. What's the other one? How about olive, olive oil? Olive oil? No. No. Uh -uh. Avocado oil. So oh, yeah. yeah, those are heat stable. Uh, olive oil, that's why it should always be in a, it's, it's light and heat sensitive. Not, not super sensitive, but sensitive. So olive oil is be, would be best in a very low heat or no heat. Uh, uh, um, uh, you said, which one did you say, flaxseed oil? Yeah, yeah flaxseed oil, like it, it, just even air hitting it, uh, flaxseed oil can go rancid. Uh, that's why most of your oils, uh, you see they're in dark uh, containers. So if you have any oils that are not in dark containers, they're probably already bad uh, because just light hitting them uh, denatures it and it actually becomes, that, that oil becomes rancid. How about uh, olive oil? Same thing, it, it should always be in a, a really uh, dark colored uh, glass or you say, whatever. You say no olive oil? I mean, you, you said olive no oil. Olive oil is good. Mm -hmm. But in the right place, right? When it's not heat, super heated. Yeah. Because then it gets denatured, becomes rancid. Uh, so what would be some healthy oils or healthy fats? Avocado oil, avocado oil, what else? Oh, the picture up there. Salmon. salmon, yeah. Fatty fish, obviously you want to make sure that they're wild caught, right? Otherwise you're looking at the toxicity, right? And so I was listening to a podcast in preparation for this workshop. Uh, he's a cardiologist, he used to be in Phoenix, but he moved to like a farm or whatever. Uh, cool thing is though, board certified cardiologist marries a chiropractor. How cool is that, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and she's kind of like the boss. She's going to tell me. Who got that, the best deal? Right? Uh, <laughs> so he totally changed his life around. Uh, his dad was a cardiologist. His dad has already passed away. Because in that system, it's not about health. It's about disease treatment and maintenance. Right? And so uh, his wife started teaching him, uh, thinking like a chiropractor, but with his educational background as a cardiologist. And so I have one of his books. You probably may have even heard of him, Dr. Jack Wolfson. You ever heard of him? So if you're taking notes, that's a great book. Uh, and he, I think it's like a free email thing. Um, but uh, he wrote The Paleo Cardiologist. They're interviewing him. Have you read that book? Have you read that mm -hmm. one? Uh, they, 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 I was listening to a recent interview, like a couple months ago, a podcast of him, three different podcasts, in fact. Uh, and when they asked him, like, so like, what's the, you know how like there's all these, there's like the vegan diet, and then there's like vegetarian, and then like, you know, kind of like clean eating, like we've done challenges before, and then like you can go, uh, and then paleo, and then you can go all the way to like, uh, have you, anyone heard of the carnivore diet? Anyone, a couple people, right? Carnivore diet is literally you only eat meat, mm -hmm. right? Uh, is there any fiber in meat? No. no. Yeah, no. Uh, so you can imagine taking a, doesn't happen very easily. Uh, <laughs> but, right? What he said is he's like, and he, you know, he wrote the book on paleo, the paleo, paleo cardiologist. But they asked him like, what's like the best diet? Because uh, you know, we already know that you're, you know, you like paleo and everything. Is it, you know, what about veganism? What about uh, carnivore? He's like, all of those have their place, and all of them can show benefit, 
because of really one main factor. He's like, if there is one thing that you were gonna cut from your diet, it's the toxins. The problem is, is that our, our SAD, our standard American diet, right, uh, is chock full of toxins. You go out to a restaurant, it's gonna be chock full, unless you know how to order and what to order, chock full of toxins. He's like, that's what most of these, if you do them right, you can do paleo with all bacon and all that kind of stuff, that's not gonna do you any favors, right? But if you actually did paleo non-toxic, if you did the carnivore diet with organic grass-fed meat, right, or wild-caught meat, or even if you were vegan and made sure that you didn't do chemically sprayed grain, that's gonna be the best heart protective uh, uh, thing for you. And again, the podcast, his name is Dr. Jack Wolfson. The podcast was, I believe it was a, a Max Living podcast. Did you listen to that part? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Am I missing anything out of that? No, you're good. <laughs> and, and, and which I thought was kind of like, huh? I thought he was going to say something about like toxic fat, or you know the fats, or maybe uh, maybe like you know the sugar, because that's usually the big thing is like because when you cut out sugar, inflammation goes down. But he, he's like he talks about that. But he's like the, if there was one thing that you could do to protect your heart, and this is the guy that like this is what he did. This is his zone. <laughs> it was cut out the toxins. Uh, and that, that was the biggest thing. So think about like what you're eating for breakfast. What's the toxic load of that, right? Where are you getting it, right? And so we talk about, you know, there's the clean 15, dirty dozen, but the first thing, if you're gonna switch to organic, what's the first thing that you should switch to organic? Not your veggies. Fruits, fruits. Fruits, vegetables. fruits more than vegetables typically, but what else? Meats. Meats. It's called toxic bioaccumulation, right? That's why big fish have more mercury than little fish, right? Because they eat them and eat them and eat them for you know their lifetime, right? And all that stuff uh, accumulates in their in their end organs. Same thing happens. Uh, how many how many uh, pounds of grain do you think it takes to do one factory you know poop up to their elbow farm cattle, right? Eight pounds of grain per one pound of meat of chemically toxic grain, right? Uh, and so all that stuff if you're eating the not if you're eating the conventional meat, that'd be the first one that I'd want to switch. <coughs> it talks about processed carbs and sugars, because carbs turn into the sugars that we digested into sugar, right? And so he said, very interesting, I was like, huh, I've never even thought about that before, but he said, if you take a loaf of bread, remember that part, <coughs> and ate that or versus ate the, 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 uh, the same amount of oil, as, as the bread, you would actually lose weight taking that much oil in the, ne the next day. Whereas if you ate a whole loaf of bread, the body's going to store that and, you know, and, and not use it properly because it's, it's carbs and, and depending on the type of bread. Typically, excess carbs get stored as fat. Yeah. Your fat. So interesting. Very interesting. So interference. So, interference to the heart, uh, I want to get this uh, before I even hit on that. Nitric oxide, has anyone heard of what this is? Mm -hmm. Or know what this is? Nitric oxide. Cool, okay. So, I used to have an aunt who had heart disease. She was in her 40s or 50s. And she used to have this cute little vial uh, of these tiny little tablets that if she was to uh, suffer uh, chest pains, she would put one of these guys under her tongue. What's that stuff called? Right. And the way that that works is the same way that this works. Right, so how does nitroglycerin work? It blows it up. It blows it up? <laughs> no, like TNT? Uh, not quite. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, so what you're trying to do, it's nitrous oxide, which is a gas. And I know you might be looking at your spouse and thinking, well, my husband or spouse produces lots of gas, but probably not the right type of gas. Uh, and so, uh, and NO, right, nitrous oxide is actually a vasodilator, right? And so when you're having, oh, chest pains, right? Uh, you give them uh, uh, nitroglycerin and it relaxes the blood vessels, right? Which then hopefully can allow you to do CPR, revive them or whatever, get them back to normal. Or in a small case like angina, just kind of relax the blood vessels to kind of get you back into rhythm and, and back into normal. You guys, you guys follow me on this? Right? So normally our body produces nitric uh, oxide 
um, in adequate levels, uh, and we also can supplement with our food, which gives us the raw materials uh, throughout our life. Anyone here over the age of 30? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, so nitric oxide levels decrease uh, substantially after the age of 30. Uh, and so that's where, uh, this, is, this is another one, you see heart disease maybe in your family or maybe you've not watched yourself up until this point in life as well as you would like to have and you're already experiencing some of the uh, aftermath of, of that with your heart, this would be something that you'd want to supplement with. So uh, what are some foods that are excellent sources of nitrous oxide? Vegetables? Yes. <laughs> Like Which broccoli, ones? <laughs> broccoli, spinach, crucified the dark ones. Yes, that's always the right answer when you're doing a nutrition cl uh, class, but not the specific <laughs> answer that I'm looking for. Beets. 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 In fact, you've probably been seeing advertisements on TV for like beetroot powder mm -hmm. for cardiovascular health, and it's because of this mechanism, right? Uh, and so even for uh, athletic performance, Mm -hmm. You might take a uh, like even like a pre-workout or something that has some. In fact, one of those little hornet pills. Mm -hmm. I think those had some uh, uh, nitrous oxide in them as well. So all these are vasodilators. Um, guess which a, a really popular vasodilator among men and maybe their spouses. Viagra. Bingo. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> It's a thing, right? So, uh, obviously, right? So, the, go ahead, share, share what we found in, in the research of this. Oh, yeah. So, years ago, they're okay, we got high blood pressure. Hey, let's use this to bring it down. They did this big study. Okay, all the, all the men, the women that were taking it, yeah, the blood pressure is coming down. What else are you noticing? Oh, uh, amongst all the men, basically all the men, what else was different? Oh, my sex drive was through the roof. Wait a sec. Sex sells. <laughs> so forget about the blood pressure. Let's, uh, let's sell this as Viagra and we're bringing it in. Okay. So a huge hit. Let's, let's not care about the blood pressure anymore. Did, okay. Has anyone heard this? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. yeah. So Viagra was originally not, was, it wasn't meant, it wasn't meant for this. Yeah. It was meant for this. Uh, uh blood pressure. Now that, yeah, but they, they, yeah. Made, they made more money with this instead of this. Yes. <laughs> now, nitrous, nitrous oxide is, is laughing gas. Yeah, right? yeah, and, and uh, I, I think that's a different number of... Of in, ends? Yes. In 2O? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, okay, and, and, nitrous oxide. Uh, yeah, it might be NO2 or NO3. Okay. Yes, yeah. I believe so. Oof, you're taking me back to biochem? <laughs> or inorganic chem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, or, as they say on TV, we'll just circle back to that. <laughs> yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. So, uh, no, it, it, so super important. So beets is a big one, right? Beetroot powder, uh, pomegranate, another great one. <clears throat> uh, this is something that I did not get enough test strips for all of us. You can order test strips. Uh, and I'll, I'll just be honest, one of the reasons I'm taking a vacation starting tomorrow uh, is because uh, my NO2 is low. My HRV is low. And so these, all these things, all signs point to my heart, my body, my system needs a break, needs a rest, right? And so this is something like, this is how you start to hack your own body. You start listening to your own body, right? Because yeah, I can still bench press. Yeah, I can still work and do it, but at what cost, what is the cost gonna be 10 years from now, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I look at these, these markers and so there's, and there's nitrogen oxide strips that you can buy. I think they're like a bucket strip, right? And you can buy, I think Emily got them like 25, either 10 for $25 for 25, for ten dollars, I don't know, something like that. So not super expensive, but it's not like super cheap either, right? But to do that, but you have to do it empty stomach without anything in your mouth um, first thing in the morning, right? And so you uh, have some saliva on there. You put the saliva on there, and there's a scale. So anyone ever, ever uh, anyone ever do a pH uh, test, mm -hmm. right? And so you can kind of see basic, acidic, that type of thing. Even more uh, predictive of heart health, right? And so guess what it means if your nitrogen oxide levels are low. It's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It's a indicator of poor cardiovascular health uh, because blood vessel constriction and dilation 
pretty important, right? Uh, and so on that same note, uh, it, so it's, it goes from like a almost white, super light pink to like a, you know, a, a dark pinky, beady, uh, pinkish red, right? Uh, and Emily was beating the pants off me and I hate losing. Uh, so uh, I, I, gotta, I gotta work on that. So beets are going back into my smoothie personally, right? Uh, so that's one way I'm gonna attack it nutritionally, right? Uh, secondarily, I'm, I'm gonna take some time off, rest, get out of fight or flight mode, kind of calm down, cool the jets a little bit, right? Uh, omegas to give some more healthy fats, right? So omegas and krill oil to get some more elasticity to my blood vessels, super important, right? Uh, not that I'm not doing healthy fats as it is, but I'm gonna even focus on that because I, I can see that it's a deficit, right? Uh, and then we're gonna watch that, that strip go. Also, many of you guys may have heard me talk about this ring that I have, right? Anyone see these, these magic rings? It's kind of like the mood rings of the 1980s and 90s. Just kidding. Uh, instead of telling your mood, it tells your HRV. Is it magnetic? No, it's actually a little computer uh, on the inside. So it's kind of fancier than an Apple watch for half the cost. So this is called an aura ring. Highly recommend that you look into it, right? Uh, cause this is going to give you some great biometric data. I believe there's some HRV data that you can get from your iPhone. I don't know how reliable it could be. Uh, so that uh, you can look into that as well, uh, from the iPhone, but aura ring two, 300 bucks, maybe 400 bucks, something like that. Um, it does sleep cycles, deep, uh, which, have we had a sleep, uh, sleep workshop this year? I don't think we have yet. Uh, so that'll be coming. Uh, and so measures deep sleep. I'm, I'm kind of already prepping for that one. I'm just listening to another thing on it this morning. But deep sleep, REM sleep, uh, uh, light sleep, how late your length of sleep, how many times you've tossed, moved, and all of that uh, from the string temperature. So ladies, if you're tracking your cycle, uh, you, can, you can do that uh, literally through point uh, percent or you know, point tenth of a degree off, up and down. Really cool stuff uh, 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 for tracking. But anyhow, so HRV should be in between 20 and 120. Heart rate variability, does anyone know before I describe what it is? Has anyone heard of HRV before? No. Okay, so I went a little deep on that one. Okay, uh, so HRV, heart rate variability, is your your body have sympathetic and parasympathetic, right? We've heard of this. Fight or flight versus rest and digest. Fight or flight. <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. Bear comes in here, what happens to our blood pressure? Goes up. Goes up. What happens to our uh, digestion? How does it work? Shuts down. So, does anyone have a small dog? If I went boo to your small dog, what would they do? Yeah. All over the place, right? Uh, right? Same with us, right? So, when we're in fight or flight, how does our GI system work? Not so good, right? Not so good. So, you might have diarrhea, might have constipation, might have IBS, right? Uh, sexual function. When you're stressed out, how does that work? Yeah, not so much, right? Uh, so infertility, right? So all of these things, when you're in fight or flight mode, right? Uh, in stress mode, those things don't work so well. Blood pressure, right? Uh, how about uh, pulse, right? How about breathing? Yeah, go Shallow, yeah. faster, faster yeah. right? Heart rate variability is your heart cycle, your heart wave, right? Uh, uh, this is in milliseconds, but it should have some variability uh, in, in a given period of time. And so, um, so each beat of your heart is not exactly the same. There can be a, a timing difference and there should be a timing difference, which is, allows for some adaptability. The greater the timing difference, uh, the greater the adaptability, so that way uh, you can respond and adapt to things. When you're in fight or flight mode, when you're in stress mode, you, you have to narrow in that heart, right? Because it needs to pump blood to all your organs super efficiently. And so it has no room for error. So it's like, literally, if you're running your car, it's like flooring it the whole time. And so it's like redlining it the whole time, right? There's, there's no room for error. And so the less variability they have, the less adaptability you have and your heart has. Great for short periods of time, not great for long periods of time. And it's another predictor risk factor for cardiovascular disease and death, right? And so uh, I've noticed that mine's in the low 20s, uh, low to mid 20s consistently. I'm a college athlete. I work out every day, every single day. My diet is cleaner than most people uh, that I know, right? So what the heck, why is that? Uh, so all things add up to time to cool my jets. 
Also, based on your heart variability, it'll tell you how much you can push it the next day. So you have a good day or a good night, strong or a high uh, heart rate variability. Now I can go harder in my workout. I can go harder in my day. If it's smaller, it's a smaller number uh, HRV. Then I know that if I push it, that excess push is could be the thing that breaks me, right? It could be instead of a hard workout being good for my muscles and making me stronger, it could be the thing that makes me sick. Does that make sense? The straw that broke the camel's back, right? So. Another hack, HRV, right? Nitrous oxide, I'm gonna increase that. I'm gonna supplement uh, with, with uh, some powders that are also nitrous oxide rich. Speaking of supplements, I've never been a big, huge fan of taking a ton of supplements. Although I will tell you when I was divvying out my own, because usually Emily does it, uh, this morning, the stack is getting kind of big. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I was saying, okay, what, what am I taking? And so, uh, magnesium. Why am I taking magnesium? Heart health, right? Uh, and, and cardiovascular health. So if you have cardiovascular issues whatsoever, that'd be one that you should probably look into, right? Magnesium citrate. Uh, uh, I'm taking uh, omega, I'm taking vitamin C, I'm taking vitamin D, I'm taking uh, a fiber, I'm taking CO2, CO10. Oh, CoQ10? CoQ10. Not yet. Uh, no. Usually they, they, they would say like in your 40s start taking it uh, or if you're on a step. And so, but now I'm gonna start taking it, yeah. So the silent killer really isn't that silent. I was wondering if you ever heard of collagen. Yeah, that's actually not in the same thing, but yes, uh, I think after the age of 20, 25, what did I tell you guys? 25. 25? Uh, 25. I have all this stuff in here. It's just I gotta get, I gotta get it out. Uh, there's a collagen protein uh, supplement from Dr. Axe. They, they sold it at Target. Yeah, yeah, bone broth protein, fantastic, full of uh, collagen and, and pre-collagen stuff. Totally different workshop, but uh, if you're over 25 years old, anyone, anyone over 25? Uh, maybe, maybe you're noticing some of the skin not quite like it was before, uh, but collagen's in everything. So, right, uh, everything. So, also one of the things that I'm supplementing, I'm putting in my smoothie. I, I literally got uh, uh, collagen peptides and I, I'm dumping a spoonful of that in my smoothie uh, every single day. So, everything I'm doing right now, I realize I'm almost 40, not quite, uh, and I'm working hard. I'm, I'm noticing that, okay, things are changing. Right, and so I'm working hard so that way when I'm 60, like my goal with that 40 is, is uh, which I still have a year plus, uh, I wanna be better than I was at 30. At 30, I was in better health and shape and certainly mental fitness than I was at 20, right? And so at 40, I think I did, I've seen a guy actually do it in his, at 50, but 40 is I wanna still be better at 40 now. So you can look at your own age and say, next year, whatever that age is, I wanna be better than I was at last year or two years ago or three years ago. And what can you do to start reversing that those hands of time, right? I know this is a cardiovascular workshop. I'm also reading the book, Superhuman, which is basically anti-aging. Uh, uh, we'll have to do a workshop on, on that one as well. But if you're, if, this, if you're not taking care of this, there's no way that it's gonna last 120 years, right? And so it's not what you're doing you know, once, it's what you're continually working on and then measuring and then adapting and then remeasuring and then adapting, right? And so it's essentially what your medical doctor is trying to do, but with chemicals, right? And we just need to take control of our own health ourselves and start doing the right things. And so I, I told you that's, it's my weakness right now. So I'm gonna focus my energy on making it a strength, right? How can I get, make sure that I'm not gonna be my uncle Jeff in 13 years, right? I gotta make sure that that doesn't happen. So why do they call it the silent killer? Oh, because of the blood pressure. High yeah, because most of the time people can't feel blood pressure creeping up. Most of the time people can't feel the, uh, their arteries becoming stiff and rigid, right? Uh, but we know that that's happening because of what you did, right? And so if, if that lifestyle was set up, right? Get some tests done, figure out where you're at, 
don't listen to them or make your own decisions for your own body about what you're gonna do with that information and then start taking some appropriate action. So we're gonna fly into that. So move strategically. There are uh, exercise, good or bad for your heart? Good. Good. Is there better exercises for your heart than others? Yeah. Yes. Right, so back in the, you know, uh, 80s and 90s, uh, you know, we're doing like uh, Richard Simmons went to the oldies. Anyone else do that? Uh, uh, we're walking on treadmills or taking walks. All that. Again, walking still great for you. Not the best exercise for your cardiovascular health. What would be the best or better exercise for your cardiovascular health? Bicycle. Same type of thing. Very little variability. Jogging. Hmm? Jogging. Jogging. No, same thing. So what we want to do is kind of shift it into high gear and come back, right? So I just talked about... Stationary bike? Uh, yes, right. but if you're doing uh, interval training. So what we want to do is we want to work on that heart rate variability, right? So we want to shock it up, go high, go hard, bring it back down, right? So it's the adaptability of our heart. So we can train our heart to become adaptable, right? We're going to have the best outcome. We're going to have a heart that's more adaptable when a stressful event happens or 2020 happens again, right? Or something like that, right? So we need to be adaptable, right? And so we need to train it to be adaptable. So the standard cardio, treadmill, bike, running, jogging, walking versus what we've taught in here for the last decade that I've owned this place is high intensity interval training or HIIT training, right? I taught it all through chiropractic school. You can do it in, you, you can get super fit in like 12 minutes a day. It's not, it's not a sales pitch. It's physiologically, if you're going hard, who, who's here been to my uh, workout class? Ooh, got a bunch of newbies. There you go, Jerry. <laughs> Anyone can do it from kiddos to grandma and grandpas, doesn't matter, right? And so we'll modify the exercise, but the whole idea, just like we did to start this thing, you go hard 80, 90% of your maximum, and then you rest, and you bring it back down, and then you do it again, and then you bring it back down. And your body, not only is it great for increasing growth hormone, testosterone, uh, and, and working on actually burning fat, but it's exceptionally good, research tells us, for our heart and our health. Still that way you see advertised usually though, huh? Anyone, we already knew this, didn't know this, new information, old information? No. Where are we at with this? New? New. new yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, cardiovascular system, pretty dang important, we would all agree. Uh, there's a little system that I like to call the master control system. What, what system is that? Yeah, right? So that's why I'd like to be standing right in front of here. I pop this up because your heart, you guys have probably all watched Indiana Jones where he rips out his heart and it's still doing what? Oh, it's beating, still, right? Yeah. But what do you think tells your heart to go faster or go slower? Brain. Brain and nervous system, right? What do you think causes and tells those blood vessels to relax uh, or uh, and dilate or constrict and tighten? Central nervous system. nervous system, right? And so when we talk about ANS or PNS, uh, uh, so when we're talking about our nervous system, the blood vessel dilation constriction, that fight or flight, that's a, that's a function of our brain and nervous system, right? And so that blood vessel constriction, what they're finding out, there's a, I'll get into that in a second. Dr. Cohen, you can write that name down. The guy has a ton of little letters after his name, blah, 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 right? But he's done a lot of research on this. Uh, and what they're finding is everyone is, and I wanted to kind of say this to the end, everyone keeps talking about this plaquing of the arteries is what's causing these heart attacks and deaths, right? We've all heard this, they've all scared us, they've all shown us the, the pipe with the crap that's like 90% occluded, right? So what if, this is crazy, and this is where, don't believe me, look it up. What if it wasn't just the occlusion of the pipe, but it was the constriction of that actual pipe? that caused the heart attack. What if we went into sympathetic shock mode and vasoconstriction and all of a sudden it locked down and the lack of blood flow to your heart which caused a heart attack wasn't because of an occluded artery. It was because you're in fight or flight mode and you're in an imbalanced, unregulated nervous system that caused it to shut down. 
what they're finding is that's more and more and more of the case. But yet, their marketing is not caught up with the research. Right? Because anyone even heard this before? Mm -hmm. Wow. Makes sense. Interesting, huh? Mm -hmm. But yet, it's the number one cause of death. And all we keep talking about is our clogged pipes. What tells that pipe to relax and to contract? Right. Brain and nervous system. What are some things that can throw our brain and nervous system into fight or flight mode? Stress. What causes, what are the, what are the types of stress? Anxiety. So that's, that's, that's what we call, we call it the three T's. We have thoughts. So it's the grief, the anxiety, the, the deadlines, the, uh, uh, you know, paying my bills, it's taking the kids and blah, 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 blah right? That's, that's that, the that's, that's the, yeah, the worrying, right? The, the stinking thinking. The other one is toxins, right? So we always joke about like having 15 beers. If I had 15 beers last night, right? What do you think I'm gonna be this morning? Hung over, right? Yeah. Uh, and, right, 100% a stressor to the system, shifts you into fight or flight mode. Last one obviously is trauma, right? Car accident cases, we see them all the time in here. Uh, not to mention our micro, horrifically unnatural postural lifestyle, right? Micro traumas. The thing is, when it gets to your brain, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it was the 15 beers, the argument with your spouse last night, or the fact that you've been sniffing a computer for the last 20 years. Your brain still perceives that as stress and it goes into sympathetic or fight or flight mode. You do that consistently. Your HRV, you can read that. Your HRV is crap right? Your nitrous oxide is low, your blood pressure might be high, right? And you are set up to have one of these vasoconstrictions or these events that we would call a heart attack. Not just from the occlusion of fatty plaque in an artery, right? And so I just want to open our eyes that it's way more than that. It's not, it's not just about the clogging of the arteries. It's about the inflammation. It's about the things that put us in the fight or flight mode. It's the things that are putting our attacks on our heart instead of allowing our heart to amazingly, 60 times a minute, every minute of every single day, awake, asleep, no matter what goes on in your life, your heart is still beating. And it takes care of us and oftentimes we just give it crap, right? And never take care of it. One of the ladies I was listening to an interview, she was over 110. I don't remember the exact number, but it was over 110 years old. And I said, well, what's your secret? And one of the things she said was, I just don't stress about things. And it <laughs> hit to me, I'm like, well, that's a good secret. I'd like to learn that. But <laughs> it makes sense that there's less wear and tear on her body, you know, for the 110 years. I'm sure she had stress, but she learned to uh, control it and manage it. Things. Chiropractic for its history is patients, chiropractic patients for their history have seen lowered blood pressure, uh, have seen better cardiac function uh, over time. <clears throat> we did, I don't know if Dr. B did, but in school, uh, we had a, a physiologist, uh, was one of my teachers, and one of the, the physiology classes, the experiment was to hook up a person, uh, take their blood pressure, adjust their uh, atlas, the upper cervical, right up and through here, which controls a lot of the cardiac function. Uh, and then retest it. And what they found is that um, we found, of course, on average, we did this experiment over multiple people, right? And none of us had like high blood pressure. We were like mostly in their 20s, right? Uh, but it can normalize and regulate your blood pressure better. Uh, what the experiment, they actually published in, what, where that was published? The blood pressure article? Uh, I, I can't remember which journal it was, uh, but uh, it was better than, than two blood pressure medications. Uh, lowered it. And so, it's again, you know, sometimes we're like, oh, it's tender there, doc, or, you know, you know, a lot of people are like, well, doc, you know, don't, don't adjust my neck when you come in here. I'm like, goodness sakes, that's like the most important thing that I could do is take away stress off your nervous system, especially closer to the brain, so it can regulate itself better, right? And so a lot of people got that study wrong and they said like, well, chiropractic, you know, adjustments cure high blood pressure. That's not it at all. Chiropractic doesn't cure anything, but it removes the interference so your body can self-regulate. So if your blood pressure was too low, it would actually raise blood pressure. If it was too high, it might help to normalize it. If, you're, if you have a fever, like a lot of people are like, oh, chiropractic helps kids reduce their fever. Sometimes, 
But sometimes a fever is a good thing, right? And so sometimes you might adjust that, that, that kiddo and the fever doesn't go away or maybe even it goes up because now that brain is better in better communication with that body and the body can do what it needs to do. But if you artificially put chemicals in it, the medications, then it cannot regulate itself as well. Does this make sense? <clears throat> I'm flying through a few of these. So, some action steps. There's the free ones, and then there's ones I've talked about. You give me one second here, Eric. <clears throat> so first of all, obviously, if you're already a patient here, which I think you guys are all, are, all are, you gotta do your exercises, right? It's essential, no one's getting adjusted every day except for me uh, and my kids. And so, you need to keep that spine moving, get the stress off the central nervous system, right? All of that, shifts you more into parasympathetic, that rest and digest and heal and repair mode versus that fight or flight. Gotta do them every single day, right? Ideally, that spine should look like <laughs> this. If yours does not, then spinal molding at night is essential, right? Taking some of that stress off that central nervous system so it can talk to the rest of your body with as little interference as possible. Super important. Uh, then let's talk about what you're putting inside of it. Right? And so I encourage you, write it down. If you, if you haven't written it down, get those, get those uh, nitrous oxide strips. Yeah, get, the, get the strips, start taking it. Maybe do it like once a week, maybe do it twice a week. Kind of fight, figure out where you're at and then how your body actually responds to what you're doing with it. Right? So everyone's chemistry is slightly different, right? For different ages, we've treated our bodies differently for the last couple decades. What can we do to positively uh, influence these numbers? And then I love HRV. Uh, it, it's, it's been something I've been excited about. We used to, when I first got into practice, I had this machine that I hooked up every patient into, but it takes at least five minutes to get a good read. That's why this doesn't do HRV until the nighttime. And so it's when, when you're still, right? And so things are kind of regulated. So uh, it's called an Aura Ring. I think it's O-U-R-A. Uh, it's a good investment, maybe for you know Father's Day or for whatever, uh, pick your gift. It's a great one, especially for a loved one. Have them look at it if someone's uh, having some difficulties in that area. So you really, you, they, they, they plot it, they graph it, it hooks up to your iPhone. So there's a number that I can see every day of my readiness score, my sleep score. I can see exactly where I'm at, right? Uh, I'm also encouraged uh, and I'm thinking about getting a glucose monitor right here because glucose is such an important part of our biochemistry that how, how you might deal with eating you know, nachos might be different than the way that my body deals with eating nachos and, and my blood sugar, right? And so I can tell you, I've not done a lot of work on how my blood sugar, Dr. B probably has, uh, uh, is regulated, but it's something that we should all know so that we can all take, I mean, again, whose who's responsibility is your health? Yeah. It's, wait, it's not your insurance card's responsibility? <laughs> That's weird. Uh, no, it's ours, right? And so I wanna empower you guys, like. I'm trying to give you some of the tools and, and it's becoming more and more available that you can use this stuff to see, okay, here, here's where I'm at. If I keep doing this, is that, is that looking towards a good outcome or not so good outcome? And then you got to figure out some of the things that you're willing to do to change, to, to lead you more towards that good outcome. Right? And so, uh, we've given you a few different things when it comes to, uh, um, supplements. Right, we've talked about uh, the, the type of exercise that you should do, right? Obviously, that mindset, it's one of the slides that I skipped, right? If you wake up every single day, the first thing you do is you check your emails uh, and you start thinking about your to-do list, not good, right? It's very easy to fall into that trap. But setting up your, your they used to call it a war plan, but setting up your morning routine, so that way you set yourself up, it's, it's, you can't give from an empty cup. Right, and so setting up yourself for success. So what do you do? Like whether it's you know reading your, your Bible or doing your Bible study, or maybe it's your meditation, right? Getting your mind right, filling it up with good stuff first, so that way you can pour out the good stuff later, right? And so what are you listening to? What are you reading? What are you feeding yourself that way? Doing your spinal exercises right away, right from the get go in the morning, right? Start that proprioception, getting that spine moving. It's almost like a half a coffee to your brain, right? Starting that way, right? And then what are you feeding yourself right from the get-go? What could you do tomorrow morning that might be better for your cardiovascular health than you did this morning? And the exercise, we talked about it, 
12 minutes a day. It's pretty simple. I guarantee you can go to our website. Uh, we've taught it here, we videoed it. Uh, you can do the six exercises, it's 12 minutes. Modify the exercises for yourself. If you did that and you did it for a month, does anyone want to disagree with me that they're gonna be healthier next month? <laughs> right? So it's just a matter of just taking some action and doing it.